There's nothing more corrosive to the idea of, of free speech than sort of grandstanding on free speech the one day and then the next day sort of demanding that certain types of, of speech that you don't like be banned. And when you live in, in open free democracies, defending free speech generally involves very often defending speech that most people don't like and that you yourself might find loathsome as part of the job description. Jacob Michangama on Heterodox Out Loud. I'm Zach Rausch. Today, we explore the history of free speech, how the understanding of it has changed, and the volatile swings in public opinion about this core value. Our guest today is Jacob Michangama, a Danish lawyer, human rights advocate, and social commentator. He is the founder and director of Justitia, a Copenhagen-based think tank focusing on human rights, freedom of speech, and the rule of law. He's the author of the acclaimed new book, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media. In our interview, we discuss the origins of free speech, what a culture of free expression looks like, and why any social justice movement should consider it to be essential. Before we chat, we'll listen to Jacob's blog post, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media, read by Jonathan Todd Ross. Does America have a free speech problem? Yes, according to the New York Times editorial board. No, according to furious critics in the media and on Twitter. The history of free speech suggests that the Times has a point and that its critics view this freedom through a too narrow lens. In addition to ideological partisanship, the disagreement about the state of free speech reveals that many Americans have a reductionist and parochial understanding of this freedom, which they view as being identical to the First Amendment. Ratified in 1791, the First Amendment offers only protection against government restrictions of free speech. This was indeed a hugely important development, and the First Amendment has with time served as a crucial bulwark of American liberty, democracy, and, much belatedly, equality. The Ancient Roots of Free Speech But the history of free speech shows that the origins of this freedom stretch much further back than the First Amendment, or even the Enlightenment. Moreover, the history of free speech demonstrates vividly that the ecosystem needed for this value to thrive and flourish, in practice, is far more complex than merely being a question of protecting the citizen against the state. In truth, the roots of free speech are ancient, deep, and sprawling. The Athenian statesman Pericles extolled the democratic values of open debate and tolerance of social dissent in 431 BC. In the 9th century CE, the irreverent freethinker Ibn al-Rawandi used the fertile intellectual climate of the Abbasid Caliphate to question prophecy and holy books. In 1582, the Dutchman Dirk Kurenhert insisted that it was tyrannical to forbid good books in order to squelch the truth. The first legal protection of press freedom was instituted in Sweden in 1766, and Denmark became the first state in the world to abolish any and all censorship in 1770. Yet almost invariably, the introduction of free speech sets in motion a process of entropy. The leaders of any political system, no matter how enlightened, inevitably convinced themselves that now freedom of speech has gone too far. Autocratic oligarchs, disdainful of sharing power with the masses, twice overthrew the ancient Athenian democracy, purging proponents of democracy and dissent along the way. Hardening laws against apostasy and blasphemy curtailed the most daring free thinking in medieval Islam. In the Dutch Republic of the 16th century, Kurenhert was exiled and his writings banned on several occasions. In 
both Sweden's and Denmark's experiments with press freedom, were short-lived as absolutist rulers took back control of the printing presses. The Free Speech Recession This phenomenon of free speech entropy is as relevant today as it was 2,500 years ago, and when looking closer, the justifications for limiting free speech in the 21st century have more in common with those used many centuries past than perhaps we'd like to admit. The global club of free democracies is shrinking fast. As in ancient Athens, aspirational autocrats, from Orban in Hungary to Modi in India, view freedom of speech as the first and most important obstacle to be cleared on the path to entrenching their power. In parts of the Islamic world, blasphemy and apostasy are still punishable by death, whether enforced by the state or by jihadist vigilantes. The global free speech recession even extends to liberal democracies, whose governments are fearful of the consequences of disinformation and hostile propaganda spreading uncontrollably among the masses through new technology, and where academic and cultural institutions are internalizing the idea that the values of free speech and equal dignity are sometimes mutually exclusive rather than mutually reinforcing. Free speech entropy is not merely political, but deeply rooted in human psychology. The drive to please others, the fear of outgroups, the desire to avoid conflict, and everyday norms of kindness pull us in the direction of wanting to silence uncomfortable speakers, whether on digital platforms, on college campuses, or in cultural institutions. Like a massive body in outer space pulling in all the matter close to it, we are all drawn back toward censorship. It is therefore all the more vital to actively foster and maintain a culture of free speech to ensure that this freedom continues. Legislation is not enough on its own. This is especially true in democracies. As noted by Alexis de Tocqueville, censorship of the press and universal suffrage are two things which are irreconcilably opposed. But at the same time, he found that in America, the tyranny of the majority subjected any writer who defied majority opinion to obloquy and persecution. The Culture of Free Speech Even if societal threats to free speech can be as stifling as government-imposed censorship, determining whether private action undermines or is an exercise of the culture of free speech can be difficult. After all, free speech does not grant anyone the right to have an op-ed published in the New York Times or a huge following on social media. Still, there is a fundamental difference between reacting to ideas one loathes with scorn or criticism and demanding that specific viewpoints be purged and their authors and enablers punished with loss of livelihood or disciplinary sanctions. However committed they are to liberal and progressive values, influential educational and cultural institutions do not become more diverse, tolerant, and equal by banishing ideas, publications, and speakers that do not conform to the prevailing orthodoxy. It is particularly problematic when media institutions, social media platforms, and universities, none of whom can effectively function without free speech, come to internalize the idea that provocative opinions are dangerous, unsafe, or even harmful to their own staff, students, readers, and users. Free speech and or equality? The school of thought that drives restrictive laws and speech codes in European democracies and canceling attempts in America insists that a commitment to the equal dignity of all requires banning hate speech in order to protect minorities and vulnerable groups from discrimination and oppression. 
the digital age has shown that concerns about hate speech fanned by social media should not be taken lightly, and that words that wound can contribute to both psychological and physical harms. The impact of such hate speech tends to impose a disproportionately heavy toll on targeted minorities. However, it does not follow that censorship is an appropriate or efficient remedy in societies committed to both freedom and equality. Protecting the vulnerable from discrimination and oppression while seeking to preserve freedom and equality should and can go hand in hand. A global look at the history of free speech suggests that free speech is in fact a shield against oppression. White supremacy, whether in the shape of American slavery and segregation, British colonialism, or South African apartheid, relied heavily on censorship and repression. Conversely, advocates of human equality like Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Nelson Mandela all championed the principle and practice of free speech to great effect and at huge personal cost. In the words of the late Congressman John Lewis, without freedom of speech and the right to dissent, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. Tragically, several countries, not least India, still use hate speech laws, with roots stretching back to the era of British colonialism to silence dissenters, as well as the minorities these laws were supposed to protect. Moreover, the current tsunami of Republican-sponsored bills aimed at censoring divisive teachings on issues such as race, gender, sexual orientation, and even American history are often uncomfortably close to their anti-racist speech code counterparts when it comes to wording and the underlying philosophy that words constitute, or are comparable with, tangible physical harms. Far from serving as a remedy against cancel culture, such bills are likely to increase partisan and ideological policing of nonconformist speech to the detriment of free and open discourse without which higher education becomes stale and ultimately meaningless. Eternal vigilance against both encroaching state power, as well as the opaque, automated, and centralized privatized control of speech, will be required for free expression to fulfill its promise as a necessary precondition for democracy, freedom, and equality. But most important for the future of free speech is this. Those of us who have benefited from the unprecedented advances in human affairs— brought about by the 2,500 years of this counterintuitive, revolutionary, and deeply consequential idea, must resist the impulse of free speech entropy and contribute to keep alive a vibrant culture of free speech. Jonathan Todd Ross narrating Jacob Michangama's blog post, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media. Now, our interview with Jacob. Jacob, thank you so much for coming on to Heterodox Out Loud. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to it. We're going to be talking about a blog post that you wrote for us called Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media, which is also the title of a very recent book that you just wrote that came out in March. So before getting into the book and your core arguments, just want to get a little bit about your story. Tell us how and why you came to write this book and what was the trajectory to this point? You know, I live uh, and was born and raised in Copenhagen, Denmark, um, which is not exactly the most authoritarian state in the world. And so I, I grew up in a, in a very secular, liberal um, society um, taking free speech for granted. Um, and then in 2005, there was a Danish newspaper that published some cartoons depicted the Prophet Muhammad. And then suddenly, sort of ancient conflicts over the relationship between free speech and religion uh, that I think most, most Danes thought had been settled <laughs> were, were sort of revived. But the, it also sort of changed uh, 
the dynamics of the discussion because uh, suddenly a lot of people who might normally see themselves as very secular uh, and liberal and, and 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 very much in favor of of religion being uh, criticized and mocked uh, had second thoughts and, and saw these cartoons as, as an abuse of free speech, just punching down on a vulnerable minority, whereas the right, and, and I'm generalizing here, obviously, uh, sort of saw themselves as free speech absolutists. And, and then the dynamics changed again later on when, when center-right government sort of restricted free speech in ways that were transparently aimed at Muslims or, or sort of ra Muslim radical preachers. And then the right said, well, these these restrictions on free speech are necessary to save free speech, whereas people on the left said, well, now we're compromising our values. Uh, and so in, in 2017, I launched a, a podcast on the history of free speech and uh, that, that ran for, I think, 41 episodes. And, and the history is really, a, uh, the book is really an attempt to boil the, the podcast uh, down to a sort of coherent account of the history of, of free speech. And so your your passion for for the subject, how much of it is your own intellectual curiosity, and what's driving you? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, the more I've studied free speech, the more it seems to me that it is, um, in fact, the most important and consequential right. Also, I I think that free speech and equality are mutually reinforcing rather than mutually exclusive, as, as some people seem to argue. So I see free speech as perhaps the most powerful engine of human equality that, that we've ever stumbled upon and, and really the guarantor of all um, traditionally oppressed groups and, and minorities that, that want to, in order for, for them to be able to to advance the, the, the cause of equal dignity. I really want to talk about that because I think that's extremely relevant to a lot of the work that we do at Heterodox Academy. Can you give us just a, kind of the, the big picture view of your book and maybe just some of the core arguments that you think are relevant to Heterodox Academy's audience, which is professors, students, administrators at universities? So I argue that free speech originates in the Athenian democracy, at, at least according to, to the available historical evidence. There might have been other and older civilizations that had free speech, but if so, uh, uh, the evidence just hasn't survived. The Athenian democracy is inseparable from the, their commitment to democracy and equality. Now, not equality according to our standards, because politically it was only freeborn male citizens that could vote, and of course the Athenians had slaves. But compared to just about everywhere else, it was a radically egalitarian, where everyone, even the poor, uh, had a voice in, in direct voice in, in political affairs. But they also had a broader concept of free speech uh, called parousia, or uninhibited speech, which was sort of a, a, a civic commitment to social dissent. You know, you could poke fun at the gods, at, at mighty figures, and, and even though Socrates was ultimately executed, Due to very specific circumstances, for decades he, you know, would uh, practice uh, free speech in the agora, the marketplace uh, in in Athens, where he would sort of roast people in in, in these humiliating uh, intellectual strip teases. And so that type of egalitarian free speech, I contrast with a more elitist conception of free speech that originated in Republican Rome. So that's a much more top-down uh, form of free speech that views. Uh, ordinary people, the plebs, the ordinary commoners, as unworthy and, and perhaps even dangerous uh, uh, if, if they were allowed sort of a direct voice in, in, in affairs. So you need to have an elite that filters information. Those two concepts have, have uh, been in conflict uh, ever since, and we see it now in our digital age where social media and the internet have really um, upended traditional gatekeepers. Do you feel like we are in a unique historical moment where there's uh, particular challenges to free speech? How do you see the current moment in the long view? I think there are two ways of looking at it. There's, there's one sort of a positive outlook, which would say Americans have never enjoyed a stronger legal protection under the First Amendment than in 2022 under the Roberts Court. Um, free speech is also protected in international human rights conventions. Even authoritarian governments have to pay lip service to the idea of, of free speech. And of course, um, the digital age has given us 
uh, ample opportunities to access almost, you know, basically the entire knowledge of humankind. On the other hand, you could say that this golden age of free speech is in decline uh, and that we're in a free speech recession because even democracies adopt more and more restrictions on free speech, uh, especially in Europe. Um, um, and in the US, the culture of free speech arguably is is in decline. So the boomer generation would have a more sort of civil libertarian look at free speech and, and say that tolerance and acceptance of race of racist uh, even racist speech goes hand in hand with tolerance and uh, for, for an acceptance of racial minorities younger generations have become more skeptical uh, of that idea and then of course you have a backlash against what is perceived to be sort of a cancel culture on the left in in the terms of of now very overt attempts by the right to to legislate various forms of orthodoxies in education, even higher education. So laws attempting to ban uh, so-called critical race theory uh, that, that that really go far into to sort of purging various various topics. So that, I think, is a very destructive dynamic. Can you talk a little bit more about the the, the change that, that emerged, this generational change over time of what led to a shift in perceptions about of the value of free speech? Yeah, it's a good question. And I don't have an authoritative answer. I think that one of the reasons is that the boomer generation lived at a very particular time where you had a shift from, you know, you'd lived and seen the consequences of, of Jim Crow, for instance, and seen the importance that free speech played in liberating uh, or, or ensuring a much higher degree of, of equality that, you know, that free speech preceded, um, you know, some of the great landmark achievements uh, in, of, of the civil rights movement and the civil rights movement, you know, cherished the idea of free speech played an important role. Uh, but you also saw big differences, I think, in the culture of free speech of, of sort of more liberal civil libertarian attitudes that permitted um, Americans to say things that were not perhaps strictly illegal, but that could not be said uh, openly about, you know, morals and sex and other things that where younger generation felt differently than than their parents and, and, and grandparents. So in that sense, I think free speech was seen as inherent to sort of progress and liberalization, uh, emancipation and, and so on. Whereas younger generations have come to take the benefits of free speech for granted. And they also live in an age of social media where the the ugly sides of free speech have become much more uh, visible. And of course, it's also the fact that um, in, in the US, uh, people on the right have perhaps used free speech in a partisan manner. So talking about free speech only when it comes to uh, cultural threats from the, from the left, uh, but then you know, not caring at all ab about challenges from the right. I just want to hone in just on one point here, which is the role of social media today and how that has created a, a different dynamic around speech that uh, is somewhat new. And you can see hate speech more often online, but also all of the concerns about misinformation, fake news. How do you think about these changing technologies? I actually tend to think that free speech has its its harms and its costs, and some of those are amplified by by social media. I tend to think that the that though that the danger of social media is exaggerated. It's an it's an ancient dynamic of of elite panic. So every time that you know the institutional gatekeepers who have had a privileged access to to shape the public sphere, when their position is under attack, they tend to view it as an as a threat to to uh, the the basic values and foundations of, of society, uh, and so we've seen a lot of instances uh, of you know going back to the printing press where these disruptions have have led to these um, kind of reactions. You know, you could go back to the uh, transatlantic uh, telegraph and the New York Times in 1858 would, would write that it was too fast and and, and uh, you know. Uh, unsifted for truth. Uh, so, so, so basically, you know, information would travel too fast. You could go to someone like Alexander Michael John, who was a 
celebrated free speech advocate who thought that the commercial radio was sort of enslaving the minds of people and should not be protected by the First Amendment. And you can even see changes by, you know, Barack Obama uh, sort of uh, hailed the internet in 2006 as a junior senator, as, as, a, as an instrument that allowed him to say what he wanted without censorship. And he used social media to great effect in order to mobilize new voters uh, in both 2008 and 2012. And then after the 2020 election, he saw online disinformation as the greatest threat against democracy. So you see institutional attitudes change. So there are problems, there are potential harms. I think, you know, the, the, the January 6th attack on the Capitol would not have, have occurred without social media. Social media was instrumental in, in sort of spreading these conspiracy theories. Um, so, so there can be uh, harmful effects, just like, you know, pamphlets um, and, and radio ca- have been used to, to incite genocide and, 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 and pogroms and, and, and the like in, in the past. But, but I think that um, the harmful effects are often exaggerated and, and we have a much less nuanced picture of social media and its effects um, before. And I think that, unfortunately, tr- politicians and traditional media have a vested interest in portraying the, the, the problems of social media as, um, as more severe than they perhaps, perhaps are in the sense that traditional media have had their roles as 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 those that shape the public sphere, the narratives, the truth upended and lost revenue, ad revenue, and that politicians, you know, sense a, a loss of control. Taking a historical view on free speech, what are some of the most important insights that we can take away from the history of free speech to understand the current moment that we are in? Sure. The whole um, conflict between egalitarian and elitist free speech, I think, w- when you when you look at current controversies through that dynamic and through that prism, uh, you, you can perhaps sometimes see, sort of ask yourself, you know, am I, is this a real problem? Is it is it an exaggeration? And also sort of uh, to try to sort of break the the connection between sort of some speech may be dangerous and harmful but it uh, and so the intuitive solution is to say well then we need to ban it but it does not necessarily follow that because speech may be harmful under certain uh, in certain circumstances that laws restricting it will be uh, an uh, an effective remedy or uh, nor that it will not lead to uh, unintended negative consequences that might be worse than than the original problem you're trying to solve and then, you know, when it comes to universities, then, you know, ever since universities originated in the Middle Ages, there have been these conflicts about what can be what, what can be said at, at universities. And, you know, go back to 1917 in the U.S., you know, Columbia fired two professors for, for opposing American involvement in World War I. And, 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 and New, New York Times was praising Columbia for, for, for its decision to root out radicalism and socialism and, and, and that academic freedom didn't involve dispensing poisonous ideas. And when you look at that today, we everyone would, would say that, wow, that, that, that that's an incredible degree of intolerance. Um, but maybe some of the ideas that pe- some people want to, to, to purge from universities today will also be looked at by future generations as uh, moral panics. Uh, and, and so think twice about such such solutions. And just to close, what can we do on an individual level to help foster a culture of free speech that that you believe in so strongly? I I think we can sort of try and and, and, and force ourselves to listen to and engage constructively and in good faith with people whom we disagree with, not ascribe the the worst possible motives uh, to them. Uh, And even if they engage in sort of using straw men and sort of try to be patient and, and, and sort of extend uh, goodwill to them. I, I actually find that, that this sometimes uh, helps uh, in, in these kinds of, of discussion. And then of course, be principled. You know, there's nothing more corrosive to the idea of, of free speech than sort of grandstanding on free speech the one day and then the next day sort of demanding that certain types of, of speech that you don't like be banned. And when you live in, in open free democracies, defending free speech generally 
uh, involves very often defending speech that most people don't like and that you yourself might find loathsome as part of the job description. Jacob Michangama on Heterodox Out Loud. Our conversation is one of many thoughtful and provocative interviews we've recorded on our podcast. Find more and listen at our website, heterodoxacademy.org. Stay tuned for our upcoming conversations with HXA Conference 2022 speakers, Glenn Lowry, John McWhorter, and Batya Ungar Sargan. These insightful conversations will drop next week right here on Heterodox Out Loud. Thanks to Davies Content for producing this podcast and Kara Boyer on our communications team. I'm Zach Rausch. Till next time. <laughs>